capital punishment is, is of course, the, the controversial case at hand, but there are other sorts of cases that don't seem to be uh, unjustified cases of killing. Um, most obviously, perhaps, killing in self-defense. Most people think that uh, killing in that kind of context is perfectly morally acceptable. It's uh, uh, unfortunate, perhaps. It's um, a sad thing to have to kill in order to uh, preserve your own life or whatever, but, but most people would say that killing in self-defense is a totally justified, morally speaking, kind of activity. There are, of course, a few who say that killing, even in that case, is, is morally wrong. Um, so we don't all have the same the same intuitions here. Now, if you look at the notes for this chapter that I've posted on on the chapter in Moore and Parker's book, Chapter Twelve, well, Moore and Parker go through a number of ethical theories, general ethical theories, just to kind of orient you about what sorts of uh, ethical theories are at play in, in very often in in ethical discussions, at least ethical discussions among professional ethicists. And so one sort of view is called utilitarianism, for example, and that's the idea that, um, well, what we ought to do, how we ought to behave, so notice that's a question from the second kind of issues, is really just the action that maximizes pleasure for human beings very generally. Okay, And so that uh, ties it to the first set of issues about which things are good. So utilitarianism says, well, here's the answer to which things are good, human pleasure. And then it says, and that gives us an answer really to the second set of questions about how we ought to act. So there's a very sort of direct link. <clears throat> pleasure is the thing that's intrinsically good, and so therefore we ought to try to maximize that. Okay. <clears throat> and of course the idea is that we're trying to consider everyone here the, the theory is not that you try to maximize your own pleasure. The theory is that you try to maximize everyone's pleasure. Uh, of course, people will come into conflict about which things will provide them pleasure and so on, and then the, the task will be to, um, to make as many people happy as possible. And so you get this slogan for utilitarianism, also, often the greatest good for the greatest number. Okay. Uh, it's a kind of, uh, a kind of democratic or egalitarian view of, of ethics. Right. <clears throat> okay, so that's that's sort of one um, reason why ethics is interesting for critical reasoning purposes. We can we can and do make moral judgments all the time, and it's helpful to see that in fact we often have little arguments in mind when we make these judgments. Um, uh, a, a negative view of capital punishment may be inspired by a very general moral principle to the effect that killing is wrong. And so we can sort of reconstruct that argument. Um, we might reconstruct the same kind of argument based on the same moral principle that killing is wrong for the c conclusion that abortion is wrong, too. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, again, um, the general claim that killing is always wrong is, of course, highly controversial. And in the case of abortion, um, the other premise is controversial, too, I should think. And the premise, in effect, that abortion is a kind of killing. Well, perhaps it's the termination of something. Um, perhaps it's the termination of some kind of life. It's not clear that we want to call it uh, the end of a human life, and it's certainly not clear that we want to call it the, li the end of the life of a person. Um, but in any event, we can make these arguments, and at least we've got a valid argument. And then the question will be only about whether our premises are true. Okay. And that, of course, is the kind of the kind of goal we've been having in mind all throughout the term. Right? Is well, at least have a valid argument. Okay. Um, whether you can convince your listeners or readers about the truth of the premises is another matter. But at least give them a valid argument so they have something to think about. So if they want to resist your conclusion, they will have to focus on your premises to try to figure out which one they want to reject, if they can. Okay, that's the first part. The second part is that I claim that ethics can really 
show us the way to how much philosophy proceeds quite generally. Okay, and so I want to try to explain what I have in mind there. When we do ethics, uh, <clears throat> I think very often we proceed by first trying to suss out what our intuitions are. Now again, our intuitions might differ a bit, but I think very often there's a, there's a very strong and rich and broad common core of intuitions that we all tend to have. And so the first task is to try to suss out what those intuitions are. Most of us have very strong feelings against killing, at least at least in general, and there might be some exceptional cases that we want to try to work out when killing is acceptable and so on. Most of us have a very strong intuition to the fact that liberty is important, that it's um, generally speaking wrong to try to force people or um, uh, other ways um, have people do what you want them to do as opposed to what they want to do. Okay. Now again, there might be certain exceptions. Um, perhaps it's okay to intervene on someone's behalf when he's threatening to do harm to himself or whatever, or others. Um, <clears throat> but probably in general we have the intuition that freedom is a very important value. Perhaps freedom is one of those things that are somehow intrinsically valuable. Okay. Now, how do we do this when, we, when we're doing philosophy? Well, we suss out our intuitions, and then the thought is, well, there must be some kind of general principle or theory that explains or predicts these intuitions that we all have. Okay? And this is really where <clears throat> the parallel with uh, between philosophy and science becomes clear. Okay? In science, what do you do? Well, you gather a lot of data, and then when you've gathered all that data, you don't just let it sit there and say, oh, that's an interesting bunch of facts. No, in science there's a kind of natural human inclination toward system, toward having some kind of comprehensive understanding in very simple general terms some kind of very general theory that explains all of these data. Okay? So we don't rest content with the idea that uh, rocks seem to fall toward the center of the earth and, uh, and wounded animals seem to fall toward the center of the earth and uh, tree leaves seem to fall toward the center of the earth. We don't sort of accept all those facts as somehow primitive, as somehow unexplained, as though there weren't something more fundamental going on, something that explains why all of those things tend to fall toward the center of the earth. We tend to think there must be some more general, more basic, more fundamental, more simple reason that explains why it is that all massive things, rocks, tree leaves, wounded animals, all massive things tend to fall toward the center of the earth. And then of course someone like Newton comes along and uh, postulates just that kind of theory that has the full generality of that kind of predictive power. Right? It, the theory says uh, not only should we expect all massive things to fall toward the center of the earth, but we should also expect the moon to have this kind of effect on the, on the tides and so on. And of course that's the virtue of a scientific theory is that it has these predictive consequences. Okay? Things we can measure. And we can therefore test the theory to see if it accords with, with what we predicted it would do. Now, um, philosophy, of course, is different in certain ways. There are no genuine philosophical data in the same way that there are data in the case of science. We don't have the results of experiments. We don't have measurements, per se. What we do have are our own intuitions. This is where we started with again. Right? We suss out our intuitions on a certain topic. And the philosopher treats those very much like data. And again, very often there's a, a pretty broad consensus about, about uh, what our intuitions are in, on philosophical questions. And so then the task is similar. Well, we don't just gather those intuitions and say, oh, that's an interesting collection of intuitions. We say, well, there must be some kind of more fundamental, more basic more deep, more simple theory that accounts for why we have these intuitions. 